still here, get a kind of full view of what we're going on. So these are some formulas you definitely need to know for pre-calculus. Now guys, this is not every formula that you're going to need to for pre-calculus. Okay. What I did is I looked at all the special types of formulas that I said, all right, when we're teaching pre-calculus, you know, sometimes students forget these formulas or sometimes they don't use them when they should be used. So these are definitely formulas that you're going to need um, when you take pre-calculus and that are the most important. All right. Now, obviously there's many other formulas that are used and are important. So these are just ones that I selected that uh, I thought it was important to make a mention of. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, that is not the first one. There you go. All right, so the first formula, guys, is the quadratic formula. And yes, I know, the quadratic formula is not really technically pre-calculus content, right? It's really kind of from the algebra. You learn this in like algebra one and algebra two. But holy moly, I cannot tell you how many times students um, forget that to use the quadratic formula when they're trying to solve a quadratic. It's, it really is amazing. So this comes up actually quite a bit in pre-calculus. And I think what's important about knowing this formula is it's not really something that's taught in pre-calculus. That's why I kind of, you know, I don't really have actually, this is not an order. One, two, three, four, five is like most important. It, I'm just doing a list of them. But what happens with pre-calculus is, you know, we, we expect you to know how to solve a quadratic, either by factoring, completing the square, or whatever may be the case. And a lot of students just forget about the quadratic formula. So it's very important, especially when we're dealing with rational numbers and complex numbers, to remember how to apply the quadratic formula and when to apply the quadratic formula. Um, it is a kind of expected that you know this formula entering in pre-calculus. And um, where in previous courses, we would like, it was a part of the curriculum, it is not a part of really the pre-calculus curriculum, but it is expected that you know it. And a lot of students will forget it. A lot of students will still make mistakes on it or apply it incorrectly. The next one are not really formulas. I mean, I guess you can, but they're, they're trigonometric ratios. And you got to know your trigonometric ratios um, when you're in pre-calculus or trigonometry. You know, the sine, cosine, tangent. Remember, these are ratios, right? So what we're doing is we're, these are ratios on a right triangle with respect to an angle. All right. And so theta in this case, you know, can be the angle of a right triangle. And then we are comparing the opposite and the hypotenuse for sine, the adjacent and the hypotenuse for cosine and the opposite over hypotenuse for tan. Students get these mixed up all the time. They forget them. It is extremely important and useful to make sure you know these trigonometric ratios as you're moving through pre-calculus. And, you know, once you know these ratios, then you can go ahead and identify the reciprocal ratios, right? And you can evaluate them. And the, the, there's a whole bunch of um, doors open up for when we know these ratios. But a lot of times students have a tough time understanding these ratios. So that's why I always like to think of them, you know, they're a ratio. So I always like to think of them as a comparison, right? So when I think of sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, we know the hypotenuse is the longest side of a triangle. So the opposite is is basically when we're looking at this ratio, we're basically asking ourselves is how big is the opposite compared to the hypotenuse, right? Um, it can't be as, it can't be as big or bigger, right? Opposite is always going to be smaller than the hypotenuse. Same thing with the adjacent side. The adjacent side is always going to be smaller than the hypotenuse. And that ratio is going to be anywhere between zero and one, right? Because it can't be zero, right? Then you would only have two sides and it can't be large and it can't be one because then they'd be the same side. So I always like to think of it as a comparison is how big is one side to the other. And that's what your trigger micro ratios are really preparing. But it, Students, you know, time and time again, if they don't spend the time knowing these, they start to struggle in pre-calculus. Uh, the next one, which is pretty much the same, I, you know, it's the Pythagorean identity. So you, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You know, it's not really as necessary. I mean, we do use it, but I wouldn't say it's a, definitely a formula you need to know. Um, but definitely sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. That is the Pythagorean identity. And holy moly, guys, you can identify the other identities from there. That helps us understand um, simplifying, verifying identities. We, we use that for um, a lot of our analytic trigonometry unit. So it is extremely important to know this identity um, to I, a lot of times, you know, I teach students where it comes from, how it works, and then also how to find different identities from here. It also helps us derive our, our other identities that we learn. So I didn't want to go through all the identities like, you know, because a lot of them, I don't have my students memorize. I don't even memorize them, right? I mean, they're available. I mean, when my students take the test, they have these formulas available to them. So there's really kind of no point in and, you know, making my students, you know, say these are really important when I, you know, 
when they um, are not expected to be recalled. However, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, I would expect my students to know as well as to recall it. All right, the next one is compound interest. Now, we I do this at compound interest, um, or this is a um, yeah compound interest with a compounding period, which is representing n, and this is going to be able to find our final value um, of a initial principal. So our a represents our final value, p represents our principal, r is going to be your interest rate, n represents the number of compounds per year and T is gonna represent the number of years. So whenever we get into finance or if we're talking about E and we're getting into logarithms, you know, this formula is going to come up. And I think it's just an extremely important formula that everybody should really know, especially pre-calculus students, um, as far as understanding compound interest and understanding the how that grows. And obviously there's a lot of other formulas that we derive and that we look for, you know, as far as simple interest and continuous compound continuously and everything like that. But, you know, in the heart, of all of that unit for exponential and um, and finance is knowing how compound interest works and seeing that growth. So I think this is a, uh, a very, very important uh, formula that really I kind of base my chapter on uh, logarithms as well as on finance. You know, we start, we focus on this formula first. And I think it's really important for students to always be able to go back to this and have an understanding of all how all these elements are working towards each other from on there. The next one is for my vectors. And you know, vectors is, I think once students get into vectors in for pre-calculus, they usually start to like, oh, this is kind of easy, right? This directed line segment, they, things are starting to make sense. And you know, because it's kind of like points and it's lines and you know, it's not very, from dealing with a lot of more difficult math, they kind of get to vectors and they think, oh, this stuff is kind of getting a little bit, you know, easier. But then once we get into, you know, we then once we kind of get into angles again with trigon vectors, students sometimes start to forget how how our trigonometric um, formulas are going to be used for vectors. And a lot of that, a lot of times this comes from using our word problems or using application problems. And when we have a vector, you know, not always are we going to have an initial point and a terminal point, or not always are we going to have it in component form. So when we don't have a vector in those two forms, um, a lot of times we're going to want to use the form of our magnitude and direction. So that is what this formula is, our form. It's not really a formula, but it's a form that um, I wanted to make sure I added. So maybe I should maybe retitle this uh, lesson because it's not really so much a formula it is it is a way to represent a vector. And the way we can represent a vector is by its magnitude, right? Which is technically the length of the vector. That's going to be that double line V. And then with its angles, um, the angle of the vector, and we can represent the um, angle of the vector as for theta. So whenever we know the angle and the magnitude of a vector, we can write the uh, vector in this form. Now, if we wanted to put it in component form, all we would need to do is just distribute the magnitude of the vector times cosine of theta times sine of theta. And that's simply what you would do in that case. Um, that would be able to write it in there, but uh, when you want to put it in component form, which when solving a problem would be very useful for you. But it's definitely a formula that I'd say, you know, students, want, they usually get pretty good with vectors, but then they completely forget um, this representation of a vector. And of course, this is the one that is the most useful when we're dealing with application problems. And, you know, because typically when, we, when we're dealing with a real life situation, you know, we have a magnitude and we have an angle. Right, so we can always represent it using a vector using um, this representation. All right, and the last one is going to be for our parametric equations. And again, this kind of goes back to exactly what I was talking about with vectors. You know, parametric equations can, you know, we do a lot of with the algebraic introduction of it and everything kind of makes sense. And we're like, okay, I'm getting this, I understand it. Um, and then we get into application problems. Well, of course, when we start dealing with application problems, we're not going to always be, we, you know, we want to make problems that are going to be kind of real life. So this is going to be when we have an object, our particle that is going to be dealing with feet per second. And so we're going to be using uh, these two formulas. So when anything, anytime we have something represented in feet per second, these are going to be two um, parametric equations that we can represent the horizontal as well as the vertical measurement um, with respect to the angle, um, time, or sorry, yeah, time and the initial height. So, and also, and the initial velocity. So, which is going to be your V from there. So that is, um, 
I'm not your T, but T is sorry. T is your parameter. Is your parameter. Sorry about that. Not time. It was that is going to be your parameter. Which from there? Oh, um, actually, yeah. Which would, T would represent your time for you, which is your parameter. There you go. So a lot of times, um, we, you know, without getting into so much of the parametric equations, um, but again, like a lot of times we practice eliminating the parameter and like understanding things algebraically. But once we get into real world, you know, when we have like an arrow, and we want to find the horizontal or the vertical, you know, height or the distance or the time, we're going to want to be using these parametric equations. And um, typically I don't expect students to have these memorized. Um, usually these are going to be provided, at least for my students, but I think it's really important for them to see them, understand them and also be able to kind of work with them on that. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, that is the, um, basically the six, six um, formulas that I have. And these are all a part of my pre-calculus course that uh, if you are interested in taking, getting to know a little bit more about, then feel free just to go to briamclogan.com forward slash 